Hello, hello, hello. Welcome everybody uh, back to webinar eight. I can't believe we're saying this, uh, but we're so happy to be here. My name is James Barton. I am from Insider Guides. We produce uh, online content, print products. We, we really create uh, resources to, to prepare, welcome and support international students in Australia. Uh, recently though, we've been taking uh, the approach of helping the industry with some practical optimism through these, these webinars. And so we're really excited to be with you here today. Well, today we are taking a deep dive into diversification, student mobility and the challenges facing universities. And, and it is a huge challenge. Uh, you know, revenues are dropping and strategies are being questioned and tested. Global events are impacting the sector in all all sorts of ways and you know if you haven't worked it out by now disruption is upon us when it comes to student recruitment whether we like it or not and uh, delighted to have my co-host here today Rob Lawrence uh, who you you know he's he's I like to say he's the godfather in the sector but I don't know if he likes me saying it or not but I'll say it anyway. <laughs> welcome welcome Rob pleasure thank you thanks for having me no worries so I Rob needs Yes, yes, yes. And Rob needs no introduction. He's one of Australia's thought leaders on all things higher education. And uh, I'm looking, for your, looking forward to hearing your insights on this topic, Rob. At the end of this webinar, you'll be invited to complete a short survey. And we welcome your ideas for future webinars and discussion topics. So yeah, please, uh, please put, ask your questions at the bottom of your screen. There's a Q and A box. Feel free to ask questions. We'll try to get to some at the end and throughout the webinar as well. I'll also launch a poll. I've got some questions. I'm really curious to get your answers on. Uh, all of our webinars are recorded uh, and uh, you can access them at insiderguides.com.au forward slash webinars. And, uh, and you can see them all there as well as the webinars we have coming up. Uh, we have Steve Berridge from VU. We've got David Lloyd, the, the Vice Chancellor at UniSA in a couple of weeks. Some really exciting guests. Uh, and so, yeah, I'll, um, without further ado, I'd like to invite and uh, welcome uh, our, our guest today, John Maloney. John was appointed as the Pro Vice Chancellor of International at Deakin University in 2013. Prior to his current role, he was the Vice President at, at, at QS in, in London. Uh, Chief Executive, uh, sorry, Chief Officer at La Trobe in, uh, uh, and the Executive Director at Macquarie International at Macquarie University. So he's got a, a, a wide uh, set of experiences there and, and with, a, with a career in inter international tertiary education, heading up major change programs to drive performance across broad international agendas. John is a, a very John is very experienced to speak on the on on the topics we have here today about the future drivers of international marketing, and where the opportunities are and the red flags. So, John, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, James. It's a it's a pleasure, and it's a real pleasure to be here with uh, my um, long term colleague and dear colleague and trusted um, colleague Rob. So, it's a pleasure. Thanks. <laughs> Yes, it's it's nice having Rob here as well. It makes a, it certainly makes my job a little less frightening. <laughs> Lovely. Well, let's get into it. Um, I'm going to start off with a topic that uh, that I think a lot of the the sector is thinking about over the for the next six months, year, two years, and it's that of diversification. You know, it's it, it has become a hot topic as Australia reduces its reliance on those markets that have dominated enrolments. Yet, diversification takes time and market development investment as well. So the question I have to start off this is, is should we prioritize diversification or, we, or retain the same patterns and behaviors that have enabled growth in the past? So James, I think it's pretty clear that um, as a sector and the size that we are, uh, that we operate at these days, diversity is critical. You know, I'm fortunate. So you mentioned three sort of tier two universities that I've um, uh, had the pleasure of working at. So Macquarie University, La Trobe, and now at Deakin. So tier two, all really good universities, um, very competitive. Uh, and I worked at those universities at a time, particularly Macquarie and now at Deakin, where they've um, had strong internationalization plans and objectives and taken a sophisticated approach to it. And so diversity has been um, very much to the fore. 
We had a really balanced program. When I first went to Macquarie University back in many, many years ago, we were starting um, from a fairly low base and we really put a lot of effort in as we grew um, to make sure that the diversity was there. And that was driven about the student experience to, you know, the uh, experience of the students on campus, in the classroom. So we had um, uh, a nice balance of um, nationalities and cultures going into, um, into the university. But also it was um, sensibly about um, bus business risk mitigation. And, you know, prior to the current pan pandemic, we were really um, in, in the sector starting to see what looked like a bubble and I think was very much heading that way with the Chinese um, cohort clustering into um, a number of universities. Um, anyhow, the bubble exploded in a different way in the end, um, but it's something that at Deakin we put a lot of effort into um, and it does require a lot of effort. Uh, you really have to work at it. So well before I arrived at Deakin, for the last over 20 years now, the university has had an office, uh, maintained an office in New Delhi. And today we've got such a rich uh, program in India, not only in terms of um, the uh, student body, so we've got a, a big cohort, it's our, our top cohort at the university, uh, but we've got a rich set of relationships there around research, um, industry, uh, also um, so some of our social mission and the way we engage with um, institutions and organisations in, in India. But that's 20 years, over 20 years of consistent effort and we were really fortunate. It's also, it's not just about, you know, dedicating your mind and resources. We're also very fortunate to have um, the same woman who started that operation is still running it today. So the continuity uh, there. Mm. During my time at um, Deakin, and this was really leveraging um, what we had done as a team at Macquarie, we've spent a lot of time at developing an international network. Now that network is, it's a really strong, you know, the caliber of the people that we've got representing us um, in countries, in our prime um, source countries, um, is really high. So we've put a lot of effort into that and we get great reward from it. And it's really contributed to our diversity. So the way we view diversity in the international student or one dimension is to balance out China and India. And um, we've, we've managed to do that. And um, so that's been good. But then to focus on what we call tier three. So the next set of 10 countries. In most of those countries, we have local representation, really good people, keep us connected to the market, very current, uh, connected to our institutional partners and our agents. So that's a big effort. Beyond that, we're always um, also with an eye to uh, prospective markets, so new market development. Um, currently, that's working well for us in Africa, but that, even that's been a 10-year project, and we're starting mm. to see the rewards of that just more recently. And we've also, for the last three or four years, been developing um, a presence in Latin America. That's really been, um, that's a slow burn, but we do think that we need to be taking a long-term view on Latin America. <laughs> so the diversity thing is, is a big, big piece for us. It's something that we're um, very mindful of, we plan for it, and we invest in it. And um, we're patient with it. It must be hard though with the, with the marketing messages for each of these different markets that you're going for. I mean, the marketing messages must be, a, must be a challenge. Yeah. So some of it, of course, is, is common. Um, you know, the, the um, jobs in this globalized world, there are commonalities there and Rob's expert in that he might want to mention something about that. Um, but then it comes back to, you know, the local representation. I do think that's a really important part of it. So being able to take whatever the messages are, and then that's about language, local language. Um, it's about culture. It's about understanding what the drivers are, what the thoughts of the parents and um, the advisors of the students, as well as the wishes of the students are. And then translating that into the local um, situation. Cool. Yeah, I could build on that comment. Just a, a, one quick observation is that um, all new markets, they rely on the networks of people that are here. 
And so that takes time to build. And until they get networks and that local sense, it takes a while to build. But John, you mentioned also about India, you mentioned some other markets. And obviously over the past uh, decade, I'd say, a significant proportion of Australia's international students um, do come from these more price sensitive markets. And you know, we both know that this is a vulnerable cohort that relies on part-time employment, access to various forms of support, such as loans and from their own country. Are you anticipating that this price sensitive cohort will recover? And if so, what do we as a sector need to offer to enable this to ensure what can only be, must be a safe and positive student experience? Yeah. So I think um, a part of the answer to that, Rob, is in the nature of the recovery. So, you know, um, talking to colleagues around the um, sector at the moment, there's sort of polarised views. Some people are expecting a V-shaped recovery. You know, and I can understand that because some of the demand indicators remain. And, you know, we've all seen the QSES um, survey of um, students and the, the way that they're really sticking to their plans. IDP um, surveys uh, produced a similar result. But then um, I don't really, I, I think that, you know, we've fallen off a cliff, absolutely, and you don't fall back up a cliff, you work your way back up a cliff. I think it's going to be a U-shaped uh, return, uh, but the, even then the nature of that is, um, I guess over the next six months we'll get a, a better sense of that. So with the nature of the demand, even in very price sensitive, you know, for the next year or so in very price sensitive um, regions such as South Asia, I think perhaps the reality will be that we're being highly selective and because we'll have limited opportunity to bring students back. Um, maybe it opens up quicker, as I say, but if it's limited, um, we will be, and we're planning for this. So Deacon, we will be counseling students beyond the visa requirements for financial capacity. It will be a, um, uh, a very deliberate conversation about what is your ability to pay given the circumstances that you're, you're now being presented with. So, you know, there might be a, there'll be a quarantine um, pathway. Now, we might subsidise some of that for the students. We've also spoken about that. But, you know, the, the prospects of um, subsidising your studies with part-time work, that just may not be available for some time yet. So I think it's a bit courses for courses. But longer term, as we go down um, deeper into the recovery, absolutely, the Australian proposition is about come and get an Australian degree, but also very much, you know, spend some time while you're studying, working, you can supplement um, your, uh, your costs of living, but also get an experience of the Australian workforce, which is a globalised workforce, and that's a very attractive part of the proposition and will continue to be so in the, into the future. Well, well I agree that. with every comment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and thanks for answering about messaging because I think that's critical. Yeah, I've uh, yeah, I've I've just launched the poll uh, here. So uh, if you have um, if you have time, uh, then please uh, fill fill that in. Uh, John, that was a very very interesting. The, especially your comment about uh, you know we've just fallen off a cliff and you cannot fall back up a cliff. Uh, it's it's absolutely true, and I think we're in for a. Uh, it's a great quote. We might use that in our marketing. <laughs> Talking about marketing. Uh, look, I'll, I'll go, I'm going to move to agents here because that is a current market issue. Agents and partners are two critical channels into offshore into onshore programs. Yet universities, colleges, tapes, you know, we're, we're unable to go over there and really support the things that they have been doing so well, such as fairs and events and those sorts of things. So what, what are you hearing about the, the challenges being faced by agents and what can we as a sector do to help their recovery? And a side question is, what do you think about these virtual fairs popping up? <laughs> yeah. So I think for the agents, you can, um, you know, uh, what a traumatic time it is for us at the universities and we're all reading about the um, uh, financial challenging uh, challenges of the sector, which are very profound. So we're dealing with that. But, you know, agents have um, been such a core part of the success of the international education, higher education, which I'm involved in in Australia over 30 years. It's through deep partnership with the agents that we've really positioned Australia so successfully. 
So they've made that amazing contribution and many of them have remained small or very small businesses. So, you know, cash flow is critical and they're really going to be challenged. And I do expect that we will see some rationalisation because this period of um, lower uh, flows of international students is going to draw on for some time. I think that the, um, the, the, but the agents will remain really important. The other trend we've seen over the last decade is increasingly sophisticated bigger players, um, agencies. Um, and I think that, you know, the digital domain to go to the second part of your question, James, is, um, you know, that's just so progressed, uh, even from what it was three or five years ago. And those uh, bigger players, uh, agents are very sophisticated in that space. And we are increasingly sort of matching that and connecting um, through to that. So I think that um, that that's, it's, it's, you know, and then you've got China where um, even before the pandemic, we were seeing that the agent market there, which was so solid for so long, and unlike most other jurisdictions, including India, where it's more fragmented, I think, you had some very, uh, a consolidation of big national players. But their model was, you know, the regulations changed about three years ago, where the, the uh, Ministry of Education allowed um, easier access to operators of an agent business. Um, and that uh, really disrupted the, the market there. So they're facing their own set of challenges um, at the same time. In terms of virtual, I'm just blown away by how much um, innovation and energy and good stuff. It, it sort of mirrors a little bit like what we're doing today. You know, when we packed up seven or eight weeks ago at the university and sort of thinking of going home, I was thinking of Skype and clunky Skype meetings and been on all this seamless Zoom stuff and really efficient, completely exhausting, of course, but... Um, <laughs> It's been, it's been amazing. And so when I go do the rounds of our, um, our marketing and recruitment people and the amount of uh, webinars, the amount of um, uh, seminars that's happening, advising students um, and others, the connectivity is really good. Um, of course, like many universities, uh, there's been, at Deakin, we've invested a lot in our digital capacity in the international marketing and recruitment function. And so that area is just getting richer and richer. It's core to our business at the moment. So I'm pretty optimistic that when, you know, we're not gonna go back to, you know, 2019 after this pandemic. And I do think the face-to-face -face is going to remain important, getting out, supporting our agents, working with our partners. Of course, that'll still be there, but I do think the blend will be different. And I think there'll be, we, we'll really take you know, we've been pushed into this environment where we've um, had to innovate and we certainly have, and we're going to take that forward into whatever the new normal is in the future. I mean, what, what can you actually do though, to help those agents that are, that are in, the, in these situations? I'm just, I'm just curious to, to try to understand it from a university's perspective. Yeah. Uh, if these small businesses, as you said, there's thousands of small businesses around the world. I mean, what can you actually do to support them? Like, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So I think there's a, I do think there's a transition and there'll be, you know, some that will just need to maybe innovate with their own businesses or adjust. There'll be rationalizations and things that'll happen, but we'll, we'll continue to do what we've always done. You know, we, um, we, we understand the nature of their businesses. We work with them. Uh, we connect with them in a really meaningful way. You know, when I worked in the United Kingdom, the view as I was working, and when I was at QS working around the world and working into the United States, not many universities have a real appreciation, a genuine appreciation of the importance and the functionality and, and the commitment of agents. Here in Australia, we do, I think. We've worked with agents in a very genuine way and it's been to our great benefit. So I think we'll continue to do that. We'll continue to partner with them where we can help them. Of course, it's all, you know, it is a bit fraught. I mean, our, you can imagine what's happening at the university in terms of budgets and um, our ability to just, you know, we're, we're far from in a normal operating space at the moment. So it's very challenging, but these relationships are important to us and we'll continue to be flexible and look for the path forward. Thanks. Rob? Yeah, John, I, I think um, 
you've hit a couple, a lot of very key points there. I think the one thing which I've noticed is this time has been a real opportunity to almost skip a generation in the way we think. And I guess it's where we have to look about going forward. And, you know, as you know, a lot, large part of what I do is forecasting where demand will come from. So I want to kind of reverse it now and switch it the other way around. And let's bring out the crystal ball, so to speak. So from where you're sitting, what global issues will help? Uh, what global issues may impede um, the sector? You know, so what should be the industry be looking out for? The types of new opportunities, the risks, the pitfalls, the potentials. Yeah. Where do you think we could be going that way? Well, if I start with what's impeding us. So prior to the pandemic, geopolitics increasingly, the increasing decline of geopolitics globally was a massive issue. You know, if you think back to when was it, four years ago, the Sam Dastiari um, affair, if you like, and um, that just immediately ratcheting down the, um, the diplomatic relationship with um, China. And that's only gotten worse and worse. And for people like myself who have spent my working life engaging in China, that's been really challenging and very disappointing. But it's the reality that we, we work with. And now we look what's happening across the world and some of the cracks are really opening up um, under the stresses, the additional stresses of the pandemic. But um, I was asked a question late last year about, you know, what are the big challenges for, um, uh, for you know, the continuity of international education globally? And I suggested at the time that, you know, closing borders was, was a worry. And, I, I, you know, I wasn't being particularly... Um, prescient about, you know, a, a, a coming pandemic. But I was definitely thinking about, you know, um, the free flow of borders. International education globally and in Australia has been an artefact of the globalisation, the increasingly open um, economies and um, borders since the Second World War. And I just think that, you know, I do worry that we're coming into a really um, tricky period there. On the positive side, though, Rob, I think that, you know, as an industry and as sophisticated and as advanced as we are now, we're built upon thousands and thousands of relationships and years of um, practice, developing bonds of trust in the markets with the institutions and the organisations and the individuals that we work with. So China's a really good example. Geopolitics, you know, Maybe it does get a bit worse, but it's pretty, it's, it's at its lowest point that it's been in my professional life. But, you know, we've, we've got those relationships. We can work beyond, um, below the radar, if you like. And things in a very positive way are still um, happening there. So I th I, I'm reasonably confident that we can um, navigate our way forward. I'm not sure I've really answered the question that you're asking, but I think that's the sort of things that are at front of mind for me at the moment. I think you've been answering it all the way through in all your answers, actually. I think you're obviously very future casting and looking out there. Um, let's look at future market opportunities then. Let's, let's switch, maybe change the focus a tiny bit. Um, I, John, I've always, well, not always, but for a long time I've contended that the decision regarding a country is actually deeply ingrained and people become very focused in, in where they're going to go. And there's a, a strong predisposition towards place, um, city, very often, and the impact of residing networks, because as these networks give, as I mentioned earlier, they give history and identity, and they give a sense of security. Um, yet there has been a lot of commentary around other countries, Canada, for example, um, taking future market share from Australia due to timing, less rigid border restrictions, etc. And it's interesting, even today in the UK press, um, there's the question of whether mandatory quarantine measures in the UK is too little, too late. So why are we going to even bother? So what's your view about um, other countries taking market share from Australia? And are you seeing from where you sit any examples of innovations that other countries are doing in terms of their destination marketing. Yeah. So I think first thing about that, Rob, is, you know, Australia needs to be consistent, be steady, and to continue to play to its yeah. strengths. So, you know, my experience of international student flows to Australia is that 
from key source countries throughout Asia in particular. Um, Australia hasn't um, always been the first choice in terms of um, academic prestige um, or perhaps life's um, other aspects of um, the university experience. So, you know, for the longest time, if families could afford it, they would be perhaps preferencing uh, the Ivy League or prestigious American or British universities. But Australia very much came into the um, uh, picture because of our proximity, because we were seen to be a relatively safe destination. And then over time, we were pr proved ourselves by delivering um, on a positive student experience and taking good care of the students. So I think, and you know, it's been really pleasing um, during this current crisis to see the response of the states, you know, the support programs for stressed international students at a time of the greatest need. We did step forward. It took a little while, but we finally got there. Um, and I think that reputationally, we'll, um, we'll, that will be appreciated for a long time. So I think that we, um, you know, the, the big open issue now for us, uh, well, one of those major issues is um, our uh, guarantees around post-study work rights for students who have been impacted. We're not there yet, and I think we need to get there. I can understand at a time of, you know, when hundreds of thousands of additional Australians are out of work, how politically that's a really sensitive piece. But um, the path back to um, recovery uh, really requires that post-study work rights guarantee to be in place. Um, in terms of innovation uh, from, from competitor countries, I mean, I think we've all been, you know, for many years, the Canadians just kept tripping over themselves. They were, had a very fragmented system with different rules, but different states. They've really gotten their act together in recent years. Um, but I don't, I don't worry so much about the competition. I don't think it's great that America is in such a um, terrible position at the moment. I don't celebrate that in any way in terms of our industry, because I think that even though it might deliver um, short-term deviations to um, um, students preferencing Australian universities, I think goes back to my geopolitics point earlier. I think that just having such a um, terrible um, situation in America could actually have a chilling effect on international travel for students more generally. Yeah, it's a very good point, and uh, I, I would I would I do want to give a shout out to all of the uh, all of the the study bodies around Australia that are offering support for international students during this time. It's been as as John mentioned, it's um. It's great. It's great to see. And, you know, from a student experience perspective, the more you support your current students, the better the reputation down the track as well. And so I think just in that in marketing perspective, it's fantastic in terms of a you know basic human decency perspective. It's also extremely important to look after those that have come here as visitors. So it's fantastic that they're doing that. Um, I'll move on now, but before I do, I'd like to say that, uh, well, we've had 63% vote in our poll uh, so far, 127 out of 199 uh, people have voted so far. So uh, I'll close this off in five minutes and I'll share the results with you all. It's actually some, some interesting, uh, interesting results there. Uh, so if you haven't voted, please do vote. Um, let's move on now. I want to look at the English language sector. Obviously, it's a it's a bit of a canary in the coal mine kind of situation there with, uh, with the English language sector. It's a critical foundation part of of the of the tertiary of, ter of tertiary study as well and many commentators have you know have, have aired their concerns about the sustainability of that sector how can we adapt the ways in which we continue to provide english language foundation courses to 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 students and to keep the sector alive really yeah so necessity is absolutely the mother of um invention and um, with, with, so at Deakin, we've got a large uh, English language centre, Dooley. And um, at the time where uh, we, we've never closed our campuses, but we've moved our um, teaching online for trimester one, and it will be substantially online in trimester two. But as we were moving to online in trimester one, the English language centre took a pause and moved its entire um, English for academic purposes uh, to an online format, which it hadn't previously been. And, you know, they, the team just did an amazing job there. 
And um, the student experience, the feedback that we've had from the students has just been incredible. You know, um, it's, it's, it's a more standard product. So, you know, Deacon is um, got a very strong online and, and cloud-based um, approach. And so for us, the pivot in award to online for award programs was relatively straightforward. It's what acad academics do by way of course at Deakin. We've got very strong platforms and it's part of our practice. And we have 16,000 students on the cloud campus anyhow. Um, but you know, I wouldn't sit here and say that's been a great experience for all the international students. Many, it has been for many of them, but many of them are a bit lost. They're a bit frustrated with it. Hasn't been, you know, it's not what any of them is expecting. But with the English language, it's been, so we've done a survey, we got the results just recently, and it's been very positive feedback from the hundreds of students that participated in um, that survey. The other really pleasing thing about our English language program, so we run uh, five week blocks, and as we've gone into the last two five week blocks, um, acceptances have been good. They're nowhere near what they would have been in normal circumstances. But students are um, signing up. So we've had, um, you know, in the last intake, 80 students in China have signed up and they've started, they've commenced online. I'm not sure when they'll be able to get to campus, but they're remaining, um, they're commencing and um, uh, just indicating very positively that, you know, they're continuing with their plans. A bit more broadly, James, about the, the sector, English, you know, that's not really my expertise, but I imagine it's very mm. difficult for many of the providers there. Rob, what do you think? Um, I think it's a very, I, I, I'm going to mirror John's comment there about it's very difficult for the providers. And, you know, it's going to be, it's one of those very volatile markets. It's, it's vulnerable because um, people won't move very easily, even when the borders open and, Will they come here for, we've got to be really creative and innovative and offer a different experience. Um, you know, I've, I've, the numbers are, are going to be falling off the back of the cliff very soon, sadly. Um, so we're going to have to be careful. There are lots of good providers, though, who are finding alternative ways of, of changing things and delivering. Um, and we've got to keep supporting that sector because without that sector, we really are, we have got a big problem coming up. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, next um, question, Jules. <laughs> no, I know, and I was, going, I was going to think that's a nice segue into this one, because John, you've been deeply embedded in the um, uh, entire mobility space for a long time. When I first knew you, you were very strongly involved in that, and you know, I've, and I've you know, I remember walking around Macquarie with you once, and there were they had whole areas just set up for the U.S. study abroad markets at a very early stage, but. Now we've seen the collapse of both inbound and outbound ability programs. And that's a critical sector for forging awareness and perceptions of Australia. And of course, providing opportunities for Australian students and your comment about the US situation is particularly relevant there. And also enabling a diversified international student cohort. Mm. It's gonna be a while till borders reopen, um, but it's gonna be difficult as well, I think, getting people to restore faith in mobility programs. Um, what would you anticipate the future recovery is going to look like from a mobility? So, Rob, this pandemic really coincides with, it's very timely in, in terms of helping us rethink our um, student mobility program. So the student mobility program yeah. at Deakin has been terrific. It's grown a lot. We've got a good proportion of the students are going out. The um, culture and the support around the uni university for the activity is just terrific. So many ac academics, just they get it, they understand it, they support it, and there's a lot of it happening. We have, we're have we very active within the new Colombo plan, um, and so there's a lot of um, energy and good vibe, if you like, about our program. However, I think we, we were already starting to think about, okay, what next? We're operating at volume, students are buying into it, we're able to support them, um, and we've got like so many people in, you know, in this field of endeavor, we just know through practice, the positive uh, things that it delivers for students. So it's sort of been like, push the students out, get them moving because we know it's good for them and it's going to deliver. It helps sharpen up what they're doing, 
give them a better life focus and get them, uh, you know, progress them along their journey. Um, but I think we're beyond that. So that was a volume driven activity based around a uh, internet, not in, an innate knowledge that it's a good thing to do. And I think we need to, it was happening, I think, in retrospect, you know, that was a period where a lot of activity was happening, but we need to go back and start to think a bit more deeply about what is the nature of that um, uh, experience? How do we contextualize it to a greater extent, including embedding it more within the curriculum, being more deliberative about how we go about um, mobility? Even if that comes at a decrease in the activity, um, but still, still making sure that we, you know, because the face-to-face -face and the experiential will remain critically important, obviously. But we just want to think about where that sits within um, the broader context of the um, education of the students. The other bit around mm -hmm. that is the nature or the mode of it happening. So we definitely want to move beyond 90% of it being short course programs and think about the longer form. We want to think more about the partnership, linking much more of it into our priority partners in priority countries. So these are all the challenges and that just sits nicely with the pause that we've got now, which gives the university time to really um, gather its thoughts um, and to chart the path forward. Well, we, um, yeah. we've, we've, sorry, you go, Rob. No, no, that's fine. Go, you go. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank uh, you, everyone, for... Well, uh, there's so many more comments there in terms of how much I agree with John and all that. And, um, uh, you know, there's a, this creative thinking opportunity. I've never been better in one sense because we're focused. Yeah, yeah, we actually did have a, a, a question here from uh, David Riordan uh, who could fit in here, actually. There appears to be concerns about a second and third wave once borders are open. How can we plan for such outbreaks when it comes to sourcing international students in the short and medium term? John, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> yes, so absolutely. So hopefully we, we're not faced with that. But um, I mean, there's um, one of the great things that's underway at the moment, and we see a bit about this, everyone from the Prime Minister anticipating in the third wave that there will be a path for international students. Uh, Universities Australia has um, produced a document. We're certainly working with state government, as um, you know, most universities will be working with their states and the federal government. And there's a lot of energy and, and a level of optimism about um, opening up a, a secure pathway for international students in the second half of this year. I think that that's more likely to be you know, there's a lot of conjecture around that, but many things need to happen in the meantime. Um, I think it'll be fairly modest. Um, it will be um, very, you know, we will have to do it in a way where not only have we got all the health um, requirements, obviously, um, foot, we're fully compliant, but it's, it's um, doubly so, so we've got the public trust as we do that. Um, so that, that's uh, going to open up uh, a pathway. People, are, I think many are like me, think that that will happen. Mm -hmm. And then we'll move forward and see what the situation looks like for semester one next year. And hopefully we start building. But it may well be the case that we've still got a quarantine pathway then. You know, yeah. short, of, short of having a vaccine, the quarantine pathway could be here for some time. I agree. I agree. And now, look, I'm, we've got some live feedback here from the from our poll. When we asked the question, how confident are you that borders will reopen to international students post July for a limited semester two intake? 59% said they are not at all confident. So just, a, I mean, obviously, it's not a, uh, uh, it's not indicative of the entire sector, but it's a nice snapshot of the, of, of, I guess, the feel on the street that, uh, yeah, there doesn't seem to be a lot of confidence that it's actually going to happen in, in semester two. 36% said they were somewhat confident and 5% were very confident. So the, these poll results are now available uh, there. I mean, they, you should be able to all see them now. It's, it is interesting. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, the, the virtual fairs question, 44% uh, said they are somewhat worth the money and time. Uh, and um, 
yeah, I mean, they, they agree also on your point regarding diversification with 66% saying diversification is very important. And on my last question, uh, starting studies offshore and then coming onshore later, how do you feel that would be perceived from students? 71% said it's not preferable, but it's workable. And 17% said it's actually favorable. So yeah, um, I think the most interesting one there is that 59% are not actually that confident that the borders will be open. Well. Let's move on to, to, to I'd like to get your feeling on sort of the, the managing current student expectations. There's been mixed reactions from students now having to undertake part of their studies online. On one hand, they view it as a, essential under the circumstances. There's not much you can do about it. It's global pandemic. On the other, that's not really what they paid for either. Mm. How do you manage those current student expectations? Yeah. So as I mentioned, the English language students are telling it's, it's sort of doing, but that's a lighter touch, isn't it? For the award seeking students, it's a mixed bag. Um, but you know, we've got all our, all our students who are online at the moment. Um, we've created for the, um, our trimester too. So the next intake, we've created a, um, a, a unique offer for international students. We call it online to on campus. So it's taken, it's mapped out where we're presenting a number of units that students can take. They could take, we, we, we're recommending three or two just for new commencing students. They're not familiar with a platform. Uh, we wanna make sure that they're well supported and that it's a positive experience. So if they wanna take two, two units, that's good. Get up and, uh, up and running with Deacon. We'll work with you when borders open up and facilitate passage, help you with visas and that sort of thing. When we first took, two months ago, we first took that out to the market and the agents said, thanks Deacon, that's great. Um, you're thinking, you're forward thinking, you're giving us something to at least engage the market with. And we've got no idea how students are gonna receive it. Probably not very well. It's not what anybody wants to be doing. And, but as time has gone on, and particularly as um, Australia has managed the health crisis so well, what we're starting to see is more of the market is not all, and it's never gonna be a huge uptake, but the market is responding to it more warmly. And we've got students who are now um, subscribing to, to that offer. So um, I think that, you know, people realize that, and, th and then that's in the environment where, you know, what are your options? If you're not gonna do that, Will you wait? Um, yes, so some will wait, but then how long are you going to wait is another thing. Um, are you gonna to go to the US or the UK at the moment? You, or, you know, probably not first choice. So I think it's becoming a little bit more attractive, just this um, possibility to get on a path to Australia. So, you know, that's the sort of innovation that we probably need and the, and the sands are likely to shift and shift again as we move forward over the next six months, so we'll see. Yeah, I agree. Rob? Yeah, and I also would like to think of share on to that. Mm. Um, the ROI for international students so much is employment. And so ultimately, they, they, they want to see an outcome and they need, need a return on investment. We, and we are delivering that. We are, you know, it's not what they wanted, but I agree. But there's also um, what's happened is this shift towards a, almost a hybrid model of education. Um, is occurring and do you think John you know I'm thinking about different pedagogy and you know that we're seeing, seeing moves such as um, uh, more shift towards intensives potentially in the long term joint dual degree partnerships um, on campus being replaced by online in country um, and maybe a little bit of um, topping up at the end you know the whole pedagogical platform is going to change um, so do you think we're going to see other significant impacts on how we offer programs and how our role as facilitators may change. Yeah, absolutely, Rob. I think that's going to be one of the big game changers that come out of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we saw even prior to um, this crisis, things were, you know, and Deakin is a cloud um, um, savvy, uh, digital savvy university. We've got great capacity in that space. But as we've tried to leverage it around um, international markets, if you like, um, there's been lots of barriers and you're aware of them, colleagues will be aware of them. We did see some easing of that, just an opening up um, like in the last 18 months. 
So for example, we've, we're part of a trial program sponsored by DET and the Ministry of Education in Vietnam to trial online partnership with a Vietnamese university in a master's program. So that's indicative of some of these shifted thinking in that space. But you know, bang with the epi epidemic, and here we are in um, all sorts of interesting spaces with um, institutional partners looking at how we can um, carry forward our partnership plans and really a much more open conversation around how the digital domain can inform part of that or be part of that. And it's a really exciting space. It's moving quite quickly now. I don't, and you know, moves like the CSCSE, the authority in China now recognizing the online study for students um, who have been um, caught online, where they wouldn't be recognized those qualifications previously. Now, I'm not saying that post the pandemic, those sorts of liberal, liberalizations are going to remain fully intact. But I also don't think they're going to be totally removed either. I do think we'll be in a new, more supportive space. And it's a really, um, I think, um, exciting development uh, that's happening at PACE at the moment. Um, yeah, and th there are other developments. And there's also um, always elephants in the room, John, as we all know. And there's one that's kind of been at the back of my mind a little bit, and I wouldn't mind getting your view. We're seeing a large numbers of deferrals, meaning that alongside, you know, a situation could occur next year, that alongside deferrals going back, um, we might see, and um, then we've got new commencements coming in. Yeah. There may be an influx of students who have deferred, which may in turn lead to capacity issues and delivery challenges given limited class sizes and permissible numbers on campus. Um, so are you envisaging that um, the situation could possibly occur where the campus, um, which is the main point of reference for international students, let's, let's be honest, and but also there are go-to references like the library, private study areas, um, that the campus may actually have a different environment that could also affect the way people engage. And how do we manage this scenario? Mm. It's a massive issue, Rob. And, um, you know, so back to James's survey about uh, after July, I'm, I'm absolutely on the optimistic side, but I do think it'll be quite limited. Um, and so then that's in a scenario, and you know, Deakin was not the most impacted in China with the students, the Lunar New Year students who were stranded in China. So we had about 1,700. Um, I think there were about almost 70,000 weren't there in total. So we had 1,700. Um, we were really surprised that post census date, um, you know, 60% of them continued um, uh, with their studies. And of the 40% that um, didn't continue, the vast majority of those were deferrals. So they've stayed, you know, they remain hopeful to come back to Deakin and only a very um, few withdrawals. So what do we do with that? You've got, you know, over a thousand students there who are wanting to come onto campus. So if we open up places there, we've got a moral obligation to give them first um, mover advantage. And then I do think we'll have building um, a demand. So the demand will be, you know, much bigger than our ability to supply for some time to come. And I think, I don't know what the solution is to that, but it's going to require careful um, mm. consideration. Yeah, we've got a comment here from uh, Janelle Chapman from TAFE Queensland. It's really important to develop the rhetoric that the COVID-19 crisis isn't only about the university sector. The three other sectors, uh, there are, uh, the three other sectors often pathway into higher education. If we don't consider all parts of the industry, then Australia will lose out. Thanks for that, uh, Janelle. Natasha Monks from Austrade. Oh, I thought she was in Colombia. She must be up pretty early or up very late. Uh, how do you approach the perception of and value gap in terms of pricing between the online and the, the on campus? And I guess that sort of takes me to, you know, my, my question here about, you know, do, how do you anticipate demand shifting for online learning among international students as well. Yeah. So market forces will come into play and we'll, we'll see how that all plays out. But um, Deakin, you know, we have a 16,000 um, headcount uh, cloud campus and we've invested um, uh, greatly in that over the last 10 or 15 years. 
and we attest to the quality, absolutely, to the quality of um, those programs. The qualifications are the same as if you did it on, um, on campus. So they go at a premium price um, and um, that's where we're at with the international cohort as well. Um, the, but there are uh, nuances within the um, pricing. Um, we, we have a sophisticated scholarships and bursary program at Deakin, where, where, but all of that is linked to academic performance and it's measured out through different markets and ability to pay and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. that, that, um, that, that the pricing um, consideration for higher education in Australia is quite sophisticated. Um, whereas, if, Rob, even a decade ago, it was very unsophisticated. I mean, universities wouldn't yeah. look at price from year to year. It's a very different situation now, and I think that'll only get more so um, into the future. Mm. Yeah. Rob? Um, John, you know, institutions, state governments, government agencies, all the support mechanisms have all provided a lot of assistance in various ways to international students. I think we have to look at it as the sum of the whole of what's, what the combined efforts have been. Um, what challenges do you consider are greatest now and how will we need to respond in future in terms of what have we, lessons have we learned? We've talked about pedagogy, we've talked about creative thinking. Are there other lessons we've learned which really should impact the way we engage in the future? Mm. So I think, Rob, it's about going back to fundamentals. As I mentioned earlier, the Australian proposition's been very successful. What's, what's federal government given us? They've given us a really clear um, visa program. They've given us Brand Australia. Um, they've given us uh, post-study uh, work rights. And I think that these have been part of a, a, a winning formula. Um, they've given us a um, regulatory framework. I think the you know, the National Code, the ESOS Act. Um, so there are really critical bits there. Um, I'm, I'm working now for um, seven years or so here in Victoria and the support that we get through the state um, government and the international education office is outstanding. Um, yeah, so we've got, we've got those bits um, and we just need to I think, and it's hard because the politics are so hard at the moment and we are in such unusual circumstances. But on things like um, flexibility around visas, home affairs clarifying that, home affairs clarifying the post-study work rights guarantee, we very much need those things in place to be able to move forward with some certainty and to um, reassure the market that, that the Australian proposition, those fundamentals are not changing. Mm. We have a question here from uh, Brett Berquist, who I believe is the, the Director of International at University of Auckland. Uh, he, it was just, I thought I'd bring it up because what you said about, uh, about, about sort of get Australia needs to all get together in terms of moving forward. He, I'm just curious about this. He, he's, he's asked, which markets are you prioritising for Deakin in Africa? And what is the balance of a collective Australian play versus a Deakin acting solo and i just that is an interesting idea you know at what point do you say all right australia is going this way we're going to go this way uh, it's i mean when i was in the uk the universities would go it alone and the, the idea of like, the uk marketing internationally it was sort of left up to the universities to a larger extent so i'm just curious to hear your thoughts hmm. i do think that over the years that the um, federal government and um, certainly the state government here in victoria have really um the partnerships that we've formed with them in terms of market development, and I'm also thinking of things like transnational education, bilateral student mobility, the whole package, if you like, have um, they've played a really important part. When it comes to Africa, I mean, I said that, you know, we're starting to see the fruits of 10 years, a decade of engagement there. It's been a long haul. And I think we, we would have had taken... It, and, it, and it's been a solo deacon sort of effort. Um, and it would, have been benefit, it would have benefited if um, government had prioritised that. But I also understand that, you know, we're going there and it's, you know, for Australian government, for Victorian government, 
uh, their, their resources are limited. They only stretch so far. Their priority for um, Southeast Asia, North Asia, um, India is understandable. Um, Victor having said that, Victorian government's been terrific in terms of they've got a strategy for Latin America and we're fully aligned with that and get advantage out of that. Interesting. Rob, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, uh, look, I th I th the Africa bit's an interesting one because it's, um, it's, it's going to be a slow burn, as, as John says. And it's, but there are other markets. You know, I know Brett asked about um, Africa, but you know, look at how suddenly butan has took off this year or last two years um in wa as an example and it, it just takes a cohort and then it perpetuates perpetuates more so the question is where will they go and how do you facilitate that but i just want to pick up on one more point john said there which i totally i will have to endorse it's the sum of the whole again i've said use that phrase twice today but it's the complexity of what we offer and the complexity of managing all these deliverables that has made us such a strong proposition and every, every year there seems to be something new which is first to market, which uh, others may, may follow or others may um, kind of uh, adapt in their, own, in their own thinking. But it's the, it's the complexity. We've managed this ecosystem remarkably and there's so many talented individuals at all levels, because I agree with Janelle, at all levels of education um, that we must, and we mustn't ever forget ever other segments within this sector. Mm. Well, we have a question on uh, on the pricing. I think we touched on it, but I, I'll, I'd like to hear your thoughts. This this one came from uh, Leone from the West Western Sydney University. It was sent in advance. Have our tuition fees become too high? Uh, I think you mentioned it before, but in general, what do you think? Yeah. Well, certainly, it's um, you know it's a major consumer decision, isn't it? And f fees. Fees have increased a lot in Australia. I think the um, fee schedules kind of matured. I mean, if you look at, um, we put a lot of work into analysis of fees. In Australia, we look at it competitors overseas and we can see that there's a, a coherent market. There's a, there's a, a, a market that's at play there. Um, we did, a, we, we, at Deakin um, six years ago, we did some price adjusting because we thought the fees were not appropriate to the brand and we wanted them to better align with the brand and that sort of thing. But we're beyond that now. And so, you know, fee indexation, you know, in the current environment, we're probably not going to index, but in normal circumstances, we're um, carefully measuring and indexing by wage inflation mainly. Um, is, it, is it too expensive? I think the, I think the market, um, accepts the fees. Um, we do have work rights, which have been able to help, although that's going to be uncertain for some time. Um, I don't know. The other thing is, you know, the, the demand side, what's going to happen with the demand side? And um, yeah, I'm, I'm... Yeah, it's an interesting one, I think, because you know, on, on one hand, you know, tu tuition fees are, are high, are much higher than domestic students, but the... Uh, I guess what will happen, you know, and we saw that IDP survey coming out saying a lot of, a lot of students are ready to come. Uh, but if the learning changes to, you know, part online, you know, you can't go on campus all that, as much as you used to, you know, I think we talked about this last week. It would be interesting to see the perceptions, as you said, the demand side is it may change over time where students are saying, you want, you want me to pay for this? This is not what I. This is not what my friend paid for last year. And it's a completely different experience. So, um, yeah, Rob. Oh, well, we have a continuum of fees, don't we? We have a lot of a lot of a range available. But I think one of the things to bear in mind is that when we were once known for affordability twenty years ago, we weren't necessarily seen unanimously as a quality destination. And so, what's happened is that often people equate its consumer perceptions. They often equate in some markets and some societies higher fees with higher quality. And so you have to balance it. Um, what we mustn't do is, is mistakenly use fees as a vehicle for um, trying to say, oh, we're, we're going to reduce them all. And so therefore we're going to become more competitive. We still have to deliver an ROI to, to students. So it's a, it's a difficult one. That continuum has stretched, but so too are people's attitudes and perceptions. All right, well, we've got one more question here from uh, Gordon Scott, who has written in uh, 
Oh, just not just an easy, just an easy question for you there, John. <laughs> what do you think will happen to China? <laughs> China's breaking the um, the global order at the moment as <laughs> such a rising power, and that's you know, I was I mentioned you know the difficult period getting more difficult since the Dastyari affair, um, and I'm uh, living in hope that things would settle down and that very warm relationship that Australia had um, post the seventies as China opened up would sort of return. Um, it's so difficult now. And um, I just go back to, you know, all the relationships that we've estab established in higher education um, at all those levels, the um, uh, through the institutions, the organizations and the individuals. We just, we're going to have to draw on those deeply to write it out. I think that when, when we engage with um, uh, various parts of DFAT and Austrade and debt, I mean, the, we've got great representation in um, China and um, they help us uh, progress our agendas, uh, open doors, introduce us to uh, the right people and help us prosecute our case. So we do have that aspect of government, which is um, very much helping us as well. Mm. Rob? <laughs> um, I know, I know the door can be closed, so I'm on the, on the spot here. But I know the door can be closed, but I think we also have to take on board buyer behaviour. And there are still a lot of products and commodities which people want to buy from um, Australian um, uh, beef and wine and other, you know, agriculture and so on. It's, it's still a buyer behaviour. And so, if the doors are closed and there's nothing or changed or they're lim limited, then that, of course that changes things. But I agree wholeheartedly with John. You've, we've got to really show that in this industry, we deeply care um, and that we are a responsive to the needs and expectations of these students from China and that we will. And, it, and this is a good destination to send them to. It, it might not be the same for a few years, but still buyer behavior drives thinking and perceptions. Well, John, on behalf of Rob and I, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, James. Thanks, Rob. And I see very familiar, a lot of familiar faces or names in the participants uh, block. So it's great to see so many colleagues who have been, um, who have attended today. Thanks for that. Yeah, none of us have to travel ever again. We can just <laughs> stay at home and just chat like this all the time. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, um, I want well, to thank you. Sorry, you go, Rob. Thank you, being a wonderful guest. Thank you from my perspective. James? Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for coming along today. Obviously, uh, these are, um, uh, you know, we, we, we're so lucky to have, to have Rob uh, and, and John join us and, and really continue this conversation um, around Australia, around the world. There's more and more international guests joining this conversation. And, and I think the sector really uh, is, I should, should be proud. I mean, we're sticking together, we're resilient, and there is a collective sense of, uh, you know, practical optimism. That, that what is coming next, you know, we, we will get through it together. Uh, I want to thank you all again. There will be a survey sent after this webinar. So please fill that in. I just, we just want to know what we can do better. Rob, Rob and I are, 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 are trying to improve every week. Uh, please, if you, any of your international students are needing more help uh, around understanding what life is like in Australia or COVID related materials, please head to insiderguides.com.au. Our, 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 te our team are, are constantly putting up new content for them. And uh, this webinar will be recorded. It'll be available on insiderguides.com.au forward slash webinars, uh, probably by later today or tomorrow morning. Uh, and they're all on the YouTube channel as well. Next week, Steve Berridge, uh, the uh, Vice President of Future Students and International at Victoria University has agreed to join us to talk about the future of partnerships. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. And then the week after, Professor David Lloyd, Vice Chancellor of UniSA, will uh, give us a, a bit of a, a deep dive into disruption in international education and education at large. Very excited. Thank you all again and see you next week. See ya. Thanks, James. Cheers. <laughs> see you guys. Bye.